one second. Good afternoon, everyone. You have joined North Bay Healthcare's Doc Talk Live. Today, we are so pleased to introduce our diabetologist, Dr. Jay Shubrook. Dr. Shubrook, please take it away. Hi, everyone. It's so good to see you. Uh, you know, we're wrapping up summer and getting ready for the school year or the beginning of fall. And certainly, um, this has been just a crazy year and a half and, and looking forward to having more face-to-face -face dialogues with everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about diabetes on a budget. And, um, you know, I think the thing that I want to highlight today is that uh, we can find four things that can make it easier to make your diabetes care cheaper. And let's be clear, you know, diabetes is expensive and it's expensive at a personal level. It's expensive at a system level. It's certainly expensive at a country level. And while it's not our focus today, uh, diabetes and its complications probably is the largest contributor to the healthcare budget in the United States. And we certainly know at an individual level, you're paying for testing supplies, you're paying for medications. And while we used to think that the complications were the most expensive, and they are quite expensive, we now know that cost of care to prevent those complications is incredibly expensive. And so sadly, in, in a land of plenty, we see regularly that people who cannot afford their meds have to make really difficult choices. You know, you might be modifying when you take your medication, taking it every other day, or skipping doses, or stopping meds entirely because they're just too expensive, or looking for less expensive alternatives, or looking for alternative therapies. And of course, we want to be a partner with you. We want to work with you so that you can get the care you need. And, and so I guess the one request would be is that if cost of care is a concern, share that with us so that we can be part of that solution. So what are those four things? And I'll do it very quickly go through them and I hope they'll have plenty of time for questions. So I do think if you're fortunate enough to have insurance, it is good and important to know that you should know your formulary. Um, almost every insurance has preferred medications and those formularies change frequently. And it's not, if you know what your formulary is and you can come with that list when you're seeking healthcare, it's gonna help you to be able to find what medications your healthcare team thinks right, is right for you, but also get meds that might be a little bit cheaper and give you the same benefit. This is important, not only on whether it's covered, but what level the copay is. And, you know, we are in a country where we have many different medications in each class of, of meds. And so that copay difference could be a significant difference. We also know that when you're looking at checking your sugar or using a sensor, there are per, preferred devices. And so it does make sense to take the time to find out what is the preferred device for your insurance, because quite honestly, they all work the same. You know, those, the great majority of the glucose meters and supplies like that have the same benefit. So find the one that you can afford and is covered for you. And then I always encourage people to ask, when you're uh, being started on a medication, or you're taking a medication, is there a generic version available? You know, a lot of times there's not, but if there is, isn't that great? Because you may get the same benefit at a substantially reduced cost. And so generics um, take a long time to come out, but they are very important. And we live in a modern age now, right? We, and there's so many things uh, we're doing through the mail. So you can now get your testing supplies online or through bulk suppliers. Um, you know, I have the most experience on the left with Amazon and eBay. I will tell you that uh, you can get testing supplies from both. At least the last time that I check, I would recommend you consider Amazon because they guarantee that the supplies you're getting are not expired and they are not copied. And so um, eBay doesn't have the same limits of control, at least they didn't when I uh, last saw them. So if you can get supplies cheaper online, all, all, the, all the better for it. Uh, on the right-hand side, GoodRx is a website I would really encourage everyone to have. It comes with an app as well. And you can actually look at any medication, type in the medication, and it will tell you locally what is the price of that medication of all your local pharmacies. 
And so this is probably most important for people who don't have insurance coverage or who are gonna pay for something out of pocket. But sometimes you can actually get things cheaper outside of your insurance than inside your insurance. And you certainly, if you don't have insurance, something like GoodRx is also very important. Advanced Diabetes Warehouse is another area where you can get uh, bulk supplies. And then there are many patient assistance programs. And the next two slides, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I do want you to know that it's good to know that there are organizations out there trying to help people get things covered. So FamilyWise provides uh, dis discount prescription cards. Uh, Partnership for Prescription Assistance uh, provides uh, free or low cost brand name meds for the low, low income uninsured patients. Uh, NeedyMeds.com also has a database, database of programs. Uh, Insulin for Life has been a, a regular supplier of medications in Solano County during COVID. We've been able to give out uh, a fair amount of medications and uh, technology to Solano County residents on behalf of gifts from Insulin for Life. And then uh, type one diabetes also has its own special challenges. And there are some uh, organizations that can help uh, cover or assist the covering of cost um, for those patients with type one. And then the last thing I wanna show you is the manufacturer's discounts. Um, so these programs are rather complicated. Um, and they all require the patient to initiate this. And so you've got here uh, mainly uh, companies that provide insulin. And you can see that both Lilly, Nova Nordisk, and Sanofi all have programs where your insulin can be cheaper. Uh, $99 still doesn't sound very cheap to me, but compared to the whole, if you were paying out of pocket, it can be quite a bit cheaper. And it, it is important that many of these programs do not provide assistance for people with government insurance, but you will start to see some of them that will give some exception, like, a, like for example, the 90 day free supply, because of the COVID pandemic or anyone that's lost their insurance, you can get a one-time free prescription and it's usually a 90 day prescription. Um, and so certainly if you are struggling with the cost of your medications, I would really want to make sure you know that you, you know your formulary, Two, see if you can get things online cheaper. Three, know that there are patient assistance programs out there trying to help people who are struggling. And four, even the manufacturers have programs that you might be eligible for. And so while this won't uh, ease all the burden of your diabetes care, I certainly think it is important to know that while this is very expensive, we can make things just a little bit cheaper through these four uh, initiatives. So I'm happy to take questions um, and go from there. Well, I have a question. You're you're talking a lot about um, the medicines and the supplies, but there are other expenses with living a diabetic lifestyle, a healthy one, including food. So how important is it to do some pre-planning of your meals and can, are there cost savings when you do that? Also? Well, so that's a really important question. So absolutely, part of treating diabetes is living a healthy lifestyle. And that healthy lifestyle is one, being able to be physically active. And so let's start with that. And then we can talk about diet second. Um, that means we want you to be able to move. So I generally tell people as much as you can, please never skimp on your belly or your feet. So if you only had to buy one thing, make sure you get a good pair of supportive shoes. The rest of the clothes are just to cover you up. So, you know, make sure you have a safe place that you can get out and walk and it, you don't have to join a gym. You don't have to have expensive equipment. Quite honestly, a 15 to 20 minute walk after each meal is a very effective way to lower sugars. And so that's one of the things that you could do. Now, to your point, Robin, you talked about uh, food. Food is actually one of the main drivers of increasing glucose. And so we would want you to make sure, one, you don't have to make a choice between food and medications. But then two, try to find ways that you can be um, cost effective while you're buying foods that are healthy for you. And, I, and you know, quite honestly, I have found that as much as I know, your neighbors and your friends know even more. When we've had um, group classes like our diabetes education classes, we've just been amazed that you know one family member will say, you know, we can go to this grocery store on Thursdays and they have great fruit and vegetables that are cheap. But the other days it's a little bit old. Or, you know, you could go to the farmer's market and they provide these things in those days. 
Certainly the county has had a number of programs where you can get free fruits and vegetables as well if you qualify. So there is a number of options. Um, absolutely to your original um, point to your question, if you can buy in little larger quantities and plan for the week and pre-prepare, you can make that cheaper. And that's not always possible. I know if you live alone, you don't always wanna buy in bulk and have food go bad. But if there's ways that you can buy food, prepare it in advance, put it in sections so that you have it for the week, that could make it a little bit cheaper. What about snackers? Is there a way to, are there inexpensive, but still okay for diabetic quick snacks? Yeah, so I wish that was a simple answer. So absolutely, um, you know, it's very common in diabetes to have a increased appetite. And so snacking, uh, one can be therapeutic, but two, um, you wanna make sure you can afford it and you wanna make sure it doesn't hurt your diabetes. So uh, nuts are not always the cheapest, but if you can buy nuts in bulk, you can make your own trail mix. You certainly can look at um, options like putting them in little baggies. I often will also look at buying bigger containers of snacks and then making them smaller serving sizes. So you can always um, find ways to take snacking and make it so that it can be affordable. And I think one of the ways, again, back to your original point, is pre-planning, buying in larger bulk, and then breaking it down. Um, you, you've talked about the importance of fruits and vegetables, but what about frozen fruits and vegetables? They're a little more expensive, but are, are they okay when you're on a diabetic uh, diet? So absolutely, when you're looking at, when you're buying fruits and vegetables, uh, fresh is great. Frozen is a very close second, quite honestly, um, and far better than canned. Um, when you look at fruits and vegetables, we really are supposed to be eating in the season. And when you're eating in the season, you can eat fresh fruits and vegetables and they're cheaper when you buy in season. Now, we all have been a little bit spoiled. I like to have apples all year round. I really enjoy apples. But if I'm buying them that way, then I'm buying them outside of the normal season and they might be more expensive. So if you can buy, and fruits or apples are not the best frozen example, but if you can get frozen berries or other things that you can get frozen, absolutely, you're going to get almost all the nutrients and um, a little bit cheaper than, than other formats, maybe just a touch more expensive than buying fresh in season, but great choice. You touched on it a bit in your first comments, but what are the ways you don't want people to cut costs? Yeah, so there's there's a couple things that are really important, um, particularly in this day in COVID, when you're trying to find ways to cut costs but not hurt yourself. Please don't omit medicines without talking to your healthcare team. We know that having diabetes doesn't increase your risk of COVID, but it does increase your risk of getting severely ill from COVID. And so while we're worried and we're still paying attention to this, you really wanna make sure that you're staying in the best metabolic control you can. And we wanna make sure that we um, find ways that you can um, afford the medicine. So as we're trying to find ways to allow you to cut costs but not hurt yourself, don't reuse needles, please. Please make sure that you get um, supplies that are not expired. Please try not to um, omit medications. That being said, there are times where we'll take a larger tablet and split it in half. We could cut the cost of your medicines that way. Sometimes you might use lancets more than one time. While that's not ideal, it is a significant thing since lancets are not typically covered. So there are ways you can make it cheaper, uh, but certainly um, there are some things that we wanna make sure you stay safe with. Can a person get rid of diabetes um, just by not eating carbs and exercising more? So is it possible to cure diabetes or put it in remission by uh, doing lifestyle? Absolutely, I would support that you could put diabetes into remission. Diabetes going into remission means that you're able to maintain an A1C or an average sugar that is in the normal or pre-diabetes range and no medications. Now that, that has been shown to be possible, but the most important part about that is that you have to be able to maintain that for the rest of your life. I don't talk about diabetes cure because you generally when you cure something, it's gone forever no matter what you do. 
when you put diabetes into remission, you've done that with lifestyle and you may need to maintain that lifestyle. Now there is not a single right answer, but most of the data shows people with type two diabetes, if they're able to lose 35 pounds, they substantially can reduce the risk of needing any medications for their diabetes. And that could be through nutrition and exercise, that could be through a structured plan, you know, such as Verda Health or the, you know, the direct study, or it could be even through surgery. But a 35 pound weight loss seems to be the magic amount where you really see major benefits, for example, putting diabetes in remission. Why is it important to control your diabetes? What are the long-term impacts of out-of-control diabetes? Right. So, so it's, why is it important to control diabetes? What, what's the benefit of controlling diabetes? We know that diabetes is a silent and a progressive disorder. So most people have no idea they have diabetes. They find it on lab tech. Yet a third of people will have a complication on the day they're diagnosed. So we know that the disease is silent and the complications are silent. The three most common complications are problems with the eyes, such as blindness, problems with the kidneys, such as kidney failure, problems with the nerves, such as neuropathy and amputations. All of those start with silent side effects. So you, don't, you wouldn't know it unless they're screened. So if I could tell you anything, if you could get control of your diabetes early and, and really step down on therapy, you're gonna get benefits. We call that the legacy effect. We know if you can get control in the first 12 months, you'll have benefits throughout the 10 years. So it's much better to be take an aggressive standpoint for diabetes early so that you get benefits down the road. And that benefit would be maybe less medications, but certainly less likely to have any of those diabetes related complications. Can you talk more about the types of foods that are no, so somebody gets diagnosed with diabetes and they think, I can't have this and I can't have that and I can't, what, what can you have and what can't you have? So what's on the no list for food and drink when you have diabetes? And I, and I hope that um, I give a message that would be consistent with our education teams and our other providers. There really is nothing that you can't have. You know, I think too many people hear, I can't have this, I can't have that. And boy, I don't know about you, but when I'm told I can't have it, I want it more. So what I would say is a couple things. There really is no health benefit from drinking your calories. So whether that's Starbucks, that's Gatorade, that's soda, or that's juice, you really are putting, and you have diabetes, you're really putting a stress on your body and your condition. So I do think that if you're going to use any drink that has calories, use it sparingly and make it the treat that it should be. It's not something we should use every day. Um, the second thing is make sure that all of your meals are nutrient balanced, meaning that um, when you have a meal, you should have protein, carbohydrate, and fat. That means some kind of bread or starch, some kind of meat or protein, could be nuts, could be beans, and some kind of fruit or vegetable. Um, and if you have all of those things together, your body knows how to process that better. We've really moved a lot to processed foods. Processed foods are calorie rich, meaning they have a lot of calories, but they're nutrient uh, absent. And so you end up getting a lot of calories without a lot of other things that the calories are supposed to come with. And so that is also a big tax on the body. We also know that most processed foods are high in high fructose corn syrup. And you know we talk about diabetes on a budget. One of the reasons why we have high fructose corn syrup in our diet is it's cheaper than sugar but it's not cheaper for us when we look at the problems that it causes. So again, try to limit processed foods, try to treat sweetened beverages as the treats that they should be. And then if you're really craving something, go ahead and have that, have it as an occasion, have it as a treat, but just make sure that it's portion controlled. So, you know, I have found that you really, when I have a dessert, the first one or two bites is really all that I need. After that, it's just kind of an extra calories. I got the taste that I wanted. So think about reshaping, like you can have more things, just smaller amounts. You talked about foods and things you can buy in bulk. Are you able to buy medicine in bulk? Like does insulin have a shelf life? Mm. So the question is, 
um, when you're looking at ways to save money, can you get medications in bulk like you can get food in bulk? Um, and the answer is a, a sort of yes. Uh, absolutely, there has been a movement to buying 90 days worth of medications rather than 30 days worth of medications. That's one of the good things that's come from COVID. You know, we're trying to limit the number of trips that people have to go out in the world to pharmacists and, or to pharmacies. And so by getting 90 days worth of prescriptions, many people have found that it's actually cheaper than three 30-day prescriptions. So that's one thing you can do. Then the other thing is certainly when you look at the cost of your testing supplies or your technology, definitely go online and see if it's cheaper if you buy it in bigger volume. Uh, absolutely all testing supplies, insulins, and even medications have a shelf life, but they typically are quite long. And, you know, again, if they're not more than a year out, you're probably going to be fine. So I wouldn't buy more than a year's worth of medicine, but you certainly could get a year's worth of testing supplies and probably be just fine. The one caveat I would say is that you have to have a place to store it if it's insulin, because insulin you're not using yet has to be refrigerated. So just make sure you have space to store all that bulk medicine that you bought. So if somebody has a question about this, who do they go to? Right. So, you know, if you want to go know more information about getting bulk meds or, or buying things, uh, you have many resources. So for, certainly you feel free to reach out to us at the North, B, North Bay Center uh, for Diabetes and Endocrinology. Certainly, I think the pharmacists, your community pharmacists are an excellent resource and really full of great information about ways to interface with your insurance, but also ways to get things cheaper. And then also to let you know what's safe. And then finally, I think that there's been more uh, emphasis put on community-based groups to find ways that we can help people with diabetes. So for example, Diatribe is a um, community-based group that provides information for people with diabetes about ways that they can thrive with having diabetes. They're actually based out of San Francisco, but they are globally active. So if you went to, I believe it would be diatribe.org, uh, it's D-I-A-T-R-I-B-E, -E, you would be able to access all that information. Uh, type 1 Diabetes, uh, Beyond Type 1 is another uh, web-based resource, uh, JDRF or Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, and of course, the American Diabetes Association all have excellent resources for you. Um, and I would encourage you to go to their websites. And could you just briefly, for those who aren't familiar, explain the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Sure. So, you know, just to make sure we're clear about the types of diabetes, there are actually many types of diabetes. Type 1 and type 2 are the most common. The thing I would want you to know about type 1 diabetes is that it is a autoimmune disease. It's a disease where the body attacks your own pancreas, not metabolic. You can't get type 1 diabetes from eating or drinking things. It's an autoimmune disease. So when that occurs, your pancreas stops making insulin and you need to take insulin for the rest of your life to live. For people with type two, this is a metabolic disease. So your body stops processing insulin correctly and stops processing food correctly. And so most people with type two have insulin resistance and they have multiple systems that are involved. So unlike type one, where it's just, you know, the autoimmune to one line, with uh, type two, there's eight different pathways that are not working right. And so with type two, we very much more take a system-based approach where we're looking at multiple different medications as well as pretty significant changes to lifestyle, including nutrition changes and physical activity. And so our message today is that that doesn't have to be putting you in the poorhouse. Absolutely. So no, regardless of what type of diabetes you have, we want you to know there's ways that you can make it cheaper. And there are people out there and organizations out there that want to help you be able to be well with your diabetes and get the care you need. All right. I think we're out of time, but thank you, Dr. Shubrook, for being here. And um, you will be able to find this video on our Facebook and YouTube channels going forward. And thank you, Dr. Shubrook, for this wonderful talk. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.